So hi, everybody. Um, I'm Katie. And I'm Deanna. <laughs> and um, today we're going to present our um, research project that we've been working on with Dr. Who. Um, our video game is called Fresh Start. Um, it's an interactive video game with narrative immersion to educate college freshmen about mindful drinking. Um, okay, sorry. So I'm just gonna go into, um, get into how this project actually came about. And um, this all started with Doctor Who's new media um, communication class about two years ago. Her students were working on um, a campaign for responsible drinking using new media technologies. And the class actually found that the existing online um, alcohol education program was not very engaging for students. Um, like a lot of students would just click through the program and there'd be a lot of videos and text reading. So um, a lot of them didn't really retain much of the information. Um, so this inspired the class to figure out a way to make a more engaging and effective um, alcohol education program. Um, so one proposed idea was to create a um, interactive video game for the alcohol education. Uh, so Dr. Who actually reached out to a game professor, uh, Professor Fishburne. He's from the interactive multimedia department. And they launched a project with a team of students from different disciplines, communication studies, public health, and interactive multimedia. Um, so they began developing the game and researching in summer 2018 and they called the game Fresh Start. Um, and in the game, we educate students on mindful drinking skills, raise awareness about um, unhealthy drink, or about the effects of unhealthy drinking habits and demystify alcohol-related misconceptions. So um, in the picture on the left, that was the initial team um, that summer. I'm there in the middle. And then on the right, this is the most current team. So students have come and go um, throughout the whole process. Some have graduated. Um, but yeah, so it is an interdisciplinary collaboration because there are students from different disciplines. So that's been really cool. And we work together a lot of the time, but we do split up and have different tasks based on our strengths and um, disciplines. Hi, guys. Um, so I was gonna tell you about the Fresh Start narrative that we came up with for our game. And we wanted to depict the experience of a typical freshman at TCNJ. Um, so as you can see from some of these pictures, you would be introduced to some friends on your freshman floor in your dorm. And we took some time to design the characters to be either like good influence or bad influence, and then some characters that were kind of in the middle. Um, and throughout the game, you as the player can navigate different challenges that are associated with alcohol and college parties, and you can make some important decisions throughout the various scenes so that you can really have an impact on the story that you create in the game. And we designed the game itself to look like the TCNJ experience. As you can see, we have a picture of the dorm um, that actually looks like what the dorm at TCNJ is. And we also have the basement of a college party, which is another typical college experience. <laughs> um, and then for the next slide, um, we wanted to show how we put a lot of time and considerations into trying to include the various um, college student populations within our game. We wanted it to be diverse and inclusive and really represent everyone at TCNJ's campus. Um, so we made efforts to include characters with different sizes, race, um, sexualities. We also have um, characters with disabilities and um, various mental health um, diagnosis. Um, 
and we also wanted to show different students with different levels of alcohol consumption because we don't want to assume that every college student wants to drink a lot. Um, a lot of students are either non-drinkers or somewhere in the middle. Um, so yeah, this is just a picture of some of the different characters um, and trying to be inclusive in our game. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about some of the important uh, features of our game. So a huge part of it is player agency, which means that the player has the ability to exert control within the game. Um, and we give players this agency by offering different choices throughout the narrative. And these choices can lead to um, slightly different dialogue and different narrative um, paths. But um, there's only slight differences um, that the choices lead to because we wanted to ensure that players are exposed to the same um, blue running objectives and outcomes. So this um, feature is guided by the social cognitive theory. A lot of our features are actually guided by different health communication theories, as you'll see. Um, so uh, we also want to include player agency because um, it increases user uh, character connection and um, that then increases player engagement. So it's very important. And then there's a picture of one of the significant choices that players can make in the game, um, whether to call the police or not to call the police when one of their friends drinks too much and shows signs of alcohol poisoning. Um, so, but even if the player doesn't call the police, one of the other friends ends up calling. So as you can see, it would be a slightly different outcome. The police still ends up being called, but um, yeah, yeah, just how, how um, they reach the outcome kind of differs um, depending on what they choose. And then we also um, have reinforcement health messages in the game, uh, which give feedback to players in response to the choices that they make. So they're guided by the self-determination theory because positive feedback fosters feelings of uh, competence and it promotes intrinsic motivation. And these messages will pop up in the corner of the screen after a player makes an alcohol related choice and the messages will either praise the player if they make a healthy choice or correct the player if they make an unhealthy choice. Um, but both types of feedback do offer more health related information. So I'm just going to play this quick clip. It's kind of hard to see because it's small, but basically in the phone group chat, the friends are deciding whether or not they should have snacks at the pregame before a party. And here the player chooses, we should have snacks. Um, and then in the corner, top left, a feedback message will pop up saying you're right, drinking without eating is very unsafe. And then it gives more information explaining why it's unsafe. Um, so yeah, those are just two of our major features of the game. And then we also have mini games to kind of break up the narrative text a little bit. And um, the first one is called the standard drink mini game. It um, takes place at the beginning of the party scene and uh, it has players practice pouring a standard drink of different types of alcohol into a red solo cup. And we kind of teach them how to use the lines on the cup as guidelines for pouring a standard drink. Um, and then on the right is our second mini game called Peer Persuasion, uh, and it's guided by the Elaboration Likelihood Model, another health communication theory. And this model actually describes attitudes of change. And uh, the purpose of this game is to um, have players practice persuading friends to stop drinking based on the friends' um, motivation to change and their ability to process information which would be based on how intoxicated they are so the player is given um different strategies to try to persuade their friends to stop drinking and we also have points in the game a point system in this game because in our research we found that a reward system uh promotes development of intrinsic motivation and it's also associated with long-term behavior maintenance. And um, 
we also found that knowledge is conveyed, reinforced, and tested as people play uh, mini games, and it's also problem solving. So they're very important features as well. Uh, Deanna, are we still going to show or send the link in the chat? Do you think we have time? Um, we only have three minutes, so okay, I so say, probably um, not. I can put the link in the chat um, if you guys want to try playing um, the standard drink mini game um, in your free time you can copy it and put it into your browser and then try it out by yourselves. It's pretty fun. <laughs> um, okay, so for this chart, we wanted to show you guys how it was really important um, while we were developing our game to get various feedback across campus and off campus as well about our game um, to make sure that we were doing a good job and designing it. Um, we tested it with lots of different groups, as you can see, um, with various specialties such as campus police, um, some TCNJ students, um, anti-violence initiative groups, um, lots more. And we, in total, conducted about 15 play tests um, over about two years and collected feedback from over 100 people. So it was a really good opportunity to just do some networking around campus. And also we could take the feedback that we got and make some changes and improvements to our game if we thought that that was necessary. And then on this slide, we just have some quotes um, from the positive feedback that we received, but I'm just gonna give a summary of it. Um, we found that throughout this whole process, people have reported that um, the game is fun, engaging, and relatable. Um, and then a lot of people also feel that they um, are learning a lot of alcohol-related information when they're playing that they will actually apply to real life. Um, and many people commented that they feel represented in the game and that they actually see themselves in some of the characters. So we have gotten a lot of positive feedback throughout this whole process. And for the opportunities of, that this game has brought us, um, we've been able to present at various um, professional conferences, um, such as two CUNY Games conferences, um, a CUNY Health Communication Symposium, and we also just recently presented at the Kentucky Health Communication Conference this month. Um, which is one of the two major national conferences that focus solely on health communication. Um, we were also accepted to um, present at the Digital Games Research Association Conference in Finland, um, which is really cool. Um, and we're also planning on doing some releasing of the game on campus. For example, we want to um, administer it between the incoming freshman classes and we also just distributed it to the athletics um, groups on campus as their training and for Greek life as well. Um, we wanna do some future research studies, um, possibly distributing it to different universities as well. So there's just a lot of opportunities for a fresh start. Um. So yeah, now we just kind of want to talk about our takeaways from this whole project. Um, this project has been a really valuable experience for me because this is actually how I became interested in communication studies as a second major. Um, it's definitely helped me improve my writing, uh, research, and public speaking skills. And most importantly, it taught me how to you know, work with other people. And you know, working with other disciplines has been really eye-opening and has allowed me to see things from different perspectives. So it's been a really cool experience. Yeah, working with this project has also helped me realize that I really like communications and I wanted to double major in it as well as with public health. Um, more personally, it helped me realize um, my interest in the field and applying what I've learned from the project from my classes to my future career. Um, and it's just been um, helpful with my research skills, working with a team, and it's been cool to work with a lot of different groups on campus as well.
and you can let us know if you have any questions. Um, I think we have to move to the next. Yeah. yeah, so we'll save questions for the end. Thank you so much, guys. So next we have Dr. Who, Alexandra, Skyla, Katie, and Deanna, and they'll be speaking on using ethnographic research to help local nonprofits on intercultural communication class engaged in English as a second language school. You guys can start sharing the screen now. So, you share the screen? Do you want me to share the screen? Okay, hold on. Um, Let me just get it up. Okay, so I'll just start. So this project really starts from my uh, COM411 into cultural racial communication class. It's an advanced community engaged learning course. So um, one of the biggest projects that students did was uh, they grouped up and they conducted ethnographic studies at selected local nonprofit organizations. Um, and in the end, they needed to either um, provide intercultural communication guides for new volunteers that the organization could utilize to prepare uh, future volunteers or design and deliver catered workshops for patrons. And, um, and so, so the whole process, the students applied what they learned in class at the community partners site. So I wanted to, next slide. I want to go um, use one example uh, that is uh, uh, the community English school in New Jersey. Um, so that school is um, uh, English as second language school um, where it gathers students and teachers and volunteers from all, all, all walks of life and all cultural backgrounds. Um, and so a lot of them, have, uh, a lot of the students there are from East Europe and others are from uh, Mexico, Latin America and Asia. So it's a very diverse group of people. And they not only learn English there, uh, but they have formed a, an amazing community beyond their classroom. Next slide. Um, uh, so I'm gonna uh, let the two groups of students talk about their individual project. But before that, I want to say that the, that English school has five levels of English proficiency. Um, so they start from basic level all the way to level four. So uh, you're gonna hear from levels, uh, and our students are divided into five groups and each group uh, worked with one level. So you're gonna hear from the groups that worked with level three and then level four today. So um, Skyla and I were able to work with the level four students at the Community English School, which is the highest level that they offer at the school. Um, and our goal was to help the level four students continue to learn English and acclimate to American culture outside of the classroom. The methods that we used were observation, a focus group, and one-on-one -on -one interviews in order to gain the most accurate information for this type of study. And the findings, findings from our field work um, was that the ability and the ambition to learn English and about American culture was among the students that we had observed. And the school relied on volunteers to further the aid in the education of the students. Um, and the aims of our workshop were to make the students more comfortable speaking with native English speakers, um, because it was previously mentioned in our observation and in our interviews that they tend to get a little bit uncomfortable and they feel a bit intimidated when speaking with native English speakers. And it was also to give them more opportunities to learn about American culture and the English language as they had a lot of interest in that as well. And to emphasize the importance for level four students to consider volunteering if they are able to, since they are the highest level of the English school and their classes will be over soon. So they have the ability to step in and help um, other students that were once in their situation at the lower levels, if they are able to take time to volunteer. Um, so after our findings from the one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews with the students and the focus group that we conducted with all the students and the teacher, we were able to come with uh, come up with three different resources for the students to help them, again, uh, continue to learn English and become better acclimated to American culture. Um, one of them was a field trip brochure, so we found that the students were really interested in um, learning more about the history and um, just about like different landmarks and different museums and areas and stuff. Um, 
in the, I guess you could say like the tri-state area. So like New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York. Um, so we came up with a couple of local ones like the Roebling Museum. Um, we also came up with one that was in Trenton. Um, and then we also came up with like the Met and the National, uh, the Museum of Natural, uh, Natural History um, in New York. Um, and they were very excited because again, it helps them um, to hone on their English uh, speaking and reading skills, but also get to learn more about our culture and history. Um, we also came up with tips and tricks to thinking in English because we found that the students, um, uh, they were able to speak English really well being the highest level at the school. Um, so they spoke English really well and they were able to understand it really well when it was being spoken to them, but they had a little bit of a hard time with translating certain things from their native language, um, especially when it came to thinking. So thinking is, uh, thinking in the language that you want to speak in is very important in becoming more fluent in that language. So we gave them uh, just a little like sheet to help them uh, think in English. Um, then we also gave them a personal dictionary, which is going to, um, it was something that they could like write down new, new words that they were learning or words that they have a hard time remembering um, because doing that writing is going to just help them um, with the muscle memory remembering certain words and then it was like a little pocket sized one so that they could carry it around with them wherever they want. Um, so we had a few takeaways from this project. Um, so we had qualitative research experience which is something that you come across um, with communications um, so it was like that hands-on type of experience, um, doing the interviews and everything like that. Um, we were able to dispel common stereotypes towards immigrants and find that they were actually really eager to learn and willing to learn and um, were really um, just like they really wanted to, to continue to learn English and about our culture. Um, so then we also had to consider ethics in the context of communication studies. So when we were coming up with questions for the focus group and for the one-on-one -on -one interviews, we wanted to make sure that we were coming up with um, the right questions and nothing that was maybe too invasive. Um, we wanted to still respect their personal boundaries. Um, we gained a deeper understanding of different cultures. Um, it was also a very fulfilling experience to help others, um, especially in their journey here in America. Um, and then we also have been um, accepted at the 2020 New Jersey Communication Association Conference um, for this panel, uh, or for this project. So Deanna and I worked with level three at the Community English School. And our goal was to improve the learning experience for these students and to give them the English communication skills and tools that they needed to feel more confident. And in order to understand what they needed more help with, um, it was necessary that we learned about their experiences and needs through um, an observation, a focus group, and a one-on-one -on -one interviews. So we had the same methods as all the other groups. And uh, we found that the students needed the most help with communicating in important settings such as the doctor's office, grocery store, and parent-teacher conferences, and also the work environment. Um, but because we only were doing the workshop for one day, we needed to choose uh, one topic to focus on, and we chose the doctor's office because um, we figured, you know, that's very important. Uh, so that's what our workshop was centered around. And um, for our workshop, we needed to set up some different game aims or different learning goals that we wanted the class to achieve. Um, so these included making sure that the students were aware of how to successfully set up a doctor's appointment and go to the appointment and also how to recognize their own symptoms in order to maintain their health. Um, we also wanted to give the students enough materials to use after the workshop ended so that they could study this on their own and use it as a resource. And lastly, we wanted to help the students feel more confident in speaking and writing using the English vocab that we talked about in the workshop by giving them lots of feedback during the workshop and the activities that we did with them.
so I'm just going to talk about the materials that we used during the workshop. We actually created a packet um, with a lot of different like vocab words and activities for the students to do. Um, so the packet contains activities that we did with the students on that day in the workshop. And then there's also material in there for them to do at home. Um, so in the packet, we have a step-by-step -step guide for scheduling an appointment um, with the doctor and writing, and writing exercises for them to do so. And uh, we have grammar lessons in there using relevant vocab and guides for having conversations with the doctor about how they're feeling, discussing treatment options and more. Um, and then at the actual workshop, we went over uh, the relevant vocab with students and mainly focused on uh, the common symptoms like cough, fever, headache. And then we would show the pictures on the board of symptoms and uh, students had to state the correct term and this would, you know, help them practice with speaking. And then later on, students were put into pairs and we showed them pictures of common symptoms again and they had to work together to actually create sentences using the term. And then to practice writing, um, we had them come up to the board and write down their sentences. And we went over the sentences all together. Um, we offered feedback on the grammar and spelling. Um, and then I'm gonna show some pictures from the workshop. So on the left, you see, you know, a student is up at the board writing. Um, and then on the right, we actually took pictures of some of the sentences and this kind of will give you an idea of uh, what they wrote about and how we you know gave them feedback and how we corrected some things. So um, to reflect upon uh, this project we definitely all agreed that it was a really valuable experience and we learned a lot such as just how easy it is to take speaking English for granted as it is the dominant language. Um, we also found that there's a common stereotype that immigrants refuse to learn English, but that is completely untrue and all the students that we observed were really dedicated to learning English and attending these classes, which was inspiring to see. Um, the project did come with some challenges. Um, we found it a little difficult to understand everyone's accents at times and we were also very cautious of the things that we said or asked the students in order to respect their privacy as we were studying them and overall this was a really great learning experience um, because it helped us directly apply the concepts that we learned in Doctor Who's intercultural communication course and we were able to really understand the population's needs um, and see what we learned in real life. So um, here are just some quotes from the community partner. Um, they really appreciated the hard work the student put into the workshop. And, and um, they actually said that they're going to use a lot of the um, uh, techniques uh, our students came up uh, for their own uh, uh, classes. Next slide. So uh, overall, the value of this project that, um, you know, in order to provide better uh, support to our community uh, and the local communities, I think it's, uh, we need to do some research and the students really, you know, experienced the uh, research firsthand in order to really understand the wants and needs of, of the community. Um, also, uh, it, for them, it is deep learning, as you can see, because you can really apply the concept that you learn from the class um, into, um, the experience that you you have had and of course it enhances students into cultural communication competency which is a very important skill um, in this uh, global uh, global world so um that's it uh, for our panel present presentation i know that we are running a little bit behind the time so i want you to be conscious of it christine you can announce the next yeah, so the next presentation that we will have is with dr ryan cassie and delilah um, you guys can start sharing your screen and they'll be speaking on music in the series, a documentary about the music scene in Asbury Park. You guys can share the screen. Um, yeah, sorry, one second.
so this is a documentary that Cassie and I and two other students made in Dr. Ryan's documentary class um, in the spring of last year. So let me know if the audio and everything's okay. We're just gonna show the first six minutes or so. It's Saturday goddamn night in Asbury Park. You can make some more noise than that, come on. Let's get real fucking loud. I think there's always been a strong musical sense in Asbury Park that's built this community of people coming together. You know, everyone's all about supporting each other, and that's what's really special here. It's a town where, like, there's just always been music. Instead of, a, like, yeah, we, we have our own scene, and it's kind of separate from that, but for some reason it happened in the same exact spot, so there's something music's in the sewer system. The Asbury music scene is a community. That's what it is. You don't get booked. You don't, you don't really play too much unless you know people, unless you're going to other people's shows in the beginning, if you're hitting the open mic scene. So it's very much of a, you know, community aspect. I just don't think this place works without a community. I'm the vice president, technically, of Telegraph Hill Records. Um, I also play guitar in the Burns, and I do a lot of songwriting for the Burns. I front my own project, uh, The Foes of Fern. And I'll sit in for any of the bands if they need me to. I started to take music more seriously once I met Joe Pomerico in sixth grade. <laughs> so I met Fern when I was in middle school and we started uh, playing in a band together. He's a lying jerk. He brought in this whole notebook of songs he told everyone he wrote. And it was all his uncle's songs. I was so jealous. Like, dude, you've written like 50 songs? It's amazing. Like, we should start a band. Like. I came, it, was, it was for Halloween, so he came in as like a songwriter dude. I came in as a guitar player. I brought my guitar. So I was like, yo, let's start a band. You got all these songs. I know how to play guitar. You know how to play guitar. Let's do it. Around high school, he kind of took a deeper step into music, and I was still trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And as he went up to Berkeley, that kind of just inspired me to chase like these great, talented musicians that he was playing with. But I went into a different route of recording the music. Meeting Palm early on was awesome. Palm and I were on the same wavelength of just the amount of work we wanted to do in music. It was all we wanted to do. It makes you do better too, if you have history behind you as far as like all the music that's come from there. Because you can't suck if you come from where all of them come from. Bruce Springsteen. Bruce Springsteen. Springsteen. Obviously, everyone always says Springsteen. You know, you love him. Pony opened in 1974. Bruce already had two albums out. His first two albums came out in 73. A lot of his early work is very grounded in that area, especially the first two albums. A lot of references to Asbury Park. But the band that was really found, you know, the ho original house band, The Pony, was Southside Johnny and the Asbury Jukes. But Southside Johnny, I think I got it. Oh, shit, look at that. Look at that shit. There we go, yeah. Southside Johnny, he's the man. I love that guy. You know, Bruce knew these guys from the old Upstage Club in Asbury Park, which is downtown on uh, Cookman Avenue at Bond Street, and they had hung out a lot there. So when the Pony opened and Southside was playing three nights a week, Bruce, you know, when he wasn't on the road or he wasn't doing something, he would come and hang out, and he started, you know, his uh, getting up on stage and playing, and that's kind of, that was the first real scene in that, in that part of the town. The 70s was a kind of a wide open uh, time, you know, um, drinking age was 18, Vietnam War was just ending. Um, youth culture was a little bit different than it is now. It was a pretty wild period. I mean, you know, to be honest, people were having a lot of sex <laughs> because there was birth control for the first time for women. But rock and roll, yeah, the Stone Pony opened in 1974 in Asbury Park's Oceanfront. There was a circuit. It was called Ocean Avenue here was three lanes north. Kingsley Avenue here was three lanes south. It was a big oval, just all kinds of bars, restaurants, just crazy, wonderful party town. And the scene was very vibrant in the 70s. There were a lot of uh, bands at the Pony, you know, that were doing original music, and it was pretty, pretty interesting scene. Well, pretty much at uh, Convention Hall, um, just about everybody, starting in the 60s, played, um, you know, outside the Beatles. The Pony opened in 1974, okay? At that point, uh, there were some artists which many people are familiar with, of course, Bruce Springsteen. You probably know that the Rolling Stones played there. Southside Johnny. The Doors played there. The people like Bill Chinhook. Janis Joplin played there. Billy Hector. That Led Zeppelin played there in 1969, started playing at Woodstock. 
Bon Jovi. Patti Smith. Smithereens. The Ramones. Lance Larson. Grateful Dead, he had, he had Jerry Garcia play there. So many others that aren't household names, but we're all here, you know, really bringing music to the forefront of a national attention in the 70s. They referred to it as the 70s music explosion. So from that point on, Osby Park was really established as a rock and roll town. Everyone mentions like, you know, like the early 70s, like that was the time for the Stone Pony. That's, I think, our time, right? Like right now, that's happening for us. When you say you're playing the Stone Pony, they freak out. You know, other than that, like other, like other places, they'll be like, okay, that's cool, it's a grimy rock club. Which the Stone Pony is a, a grimy rock club, which is in a good way, I love grimy rock club. But uh, it's just stuck around for so long, just like places like the Saint. Um, but I don't know, there's just been so many amazing things that happen there and you get to play on that stage and it's just, uh, you should consider yourself lucky if you're up there, which I do. Okay, so that's just the, the first six minutes. It goes on for about 18 um, minutes in total. So basically this was what we did for Dr. Ryan's um, intro to, or not intro, uh, just documentary production class a year ago, Cassie and I, along with two other students. And the great thing about this class, along with other just production classes in general, but specifically, I think this class, we learned the basics of how to do a documentary, how to start filming, what you should look for, how you should start. But other than that, we had pretty much complete freedom about what we wanted to do. So this was Cassie's idea to do a documentary about um, the music scene in Asbury Park. And it was great because it was something we were passionate about. And we got to, it. I think it turned out better than what we expected. I think it's probably the thing that we're most proud of um, doing. So, so yeah, Cassie, did you want to talk about um, what we learned filming this? Oh yeah, I can talk a little bit about the whole process of sort of starting a documentary. Cause this is the first time like me or anyone else in our group had done anything like that or such a big project. And it was also the first time we'd ever really gone off campus to film. And it was insanely scary the first time having to go to like, a, like as far as like 40 minutes away from campus and having to go there and like stand on your own two feet and really call yourself a filmmaker. It's terrifying the first time, but you learn so much cause a lot of things go wrong the first couple times you do it. Then you start getting better at learning sort of what equipment you need to test out, um, how to talk with um, different people as a filmmaker, how to uh, get release forms signed and different things like that. And we end up learning so much and the end product ended up being something that we're really proud of. And along the way, we got to have a lot of experiences that were very <laughs> unexpected. Um, one of the first concerts we ever filmed at, we, it was this tiny, tiny uh, little dirty club in Asbury and there was almost no room. So we were just doing like really guerrilla filmmaking, like filming between people's shoulders. And at first we had no idea how it was gonna turn out. And then like playing back the footage, we realized how good actually everything looked and how much fun we had the whole time. So it's a really great process getting to choose your own topic and you're so passionate about it and it really shows through in the final product. Yeah, and I think in general, um, the production classes you take, if you do the RTF track or just do you wanna take an RTF class, the great thing I think about this program is you really get out of it what you put into it. So if you really want to go out there and do something really big, something you're really passionate about, the professors will help you and you'll have the tools to do that. So it's really, um, you know, there's other classes we've taken, um, Dr. Dr. Johnson Frizzell's directing class. Um, there's further documentary classes like Dr. Ryan was talking about where you can work with a bunch of people. Um, yeah, it's just a great, um, great way to get experience and do what you want to do. So I don't know, Dr. Ryan, did you have anything you wanted to add before we do questions? Um, Dr. Ryan, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, it's always a bit daunting in the beginning because over the years, I mean, I found that many people take the documentary class that aren't particularly interested in the beginning, but then once they're able to kind of find 
topic that they're really interested in, they really take off with it. And it was so satisfying to see uh, Cassie uh, and Delilah and the others in the group uh, really get into this and uh, devote the time on weekends. And then they later came back to me after the class had finished and we did an independent study where they were able to further refine the topic. Um, and as I always like to say in the class, don't think of your, your final project as just you know a classroom assignment um, that you're going to hand in and get a grade and then forget about it. Um, my goal and my hope is that students will you know, submit these films to um, film festivals. Uh, they'll use them on their uh, reels when they leave here to be able to show prospective employers that they've done a major project. Um, and so I think it really can serve a lot of purposes, as well as they made a terrific film about As the Asbury Park music scene, which is really one of a kind. Um, and I hope that they're able to, to go further with it. So if you have anything else, if, I, I don't know if they're taking questions at the end or, or what. Yeah, so we're gonna save questions for the end. So hold them. Next, we're gonna speak on double majors and minors. So our first person presenting is gonna be Chloe Freed. You can start sharing your screen and she'll speak about her experience with having a double major. Hi, uh, I'm Chloe. I don't have a screen to share, uh, so I'm just gonna like talk about it. So uh, I'm communications uh, on, the, on the RTF track, so radio, TV, and film, but I paired it also with my second major is journalism and professional writing. So the reason I combined those two back in 2016, because I'm graduating senior now, was because I wanted to be a news reporter and I wanted to be on TV. So I was like, oh, great. I could be a journalism major and communications. Um, but after being like a part of both majors, I realized there's so much more information to be pulled from each of those. And I've learned a lot and I'm like really thankful. Um, combining the two was really easy when I first went into it. Um, that's when the schools were kind of overlapping. They started to overlap and my advisors were like, this is going to be easy. You're going to be great for this. And um, I really put like a lot of thanks to them because without them, I wouldn't have known, you know, what track would be best for me and everything. And they kind of just put me on the right track for graduation. I completed all my classes on time. So now as a senior, I only have two classes. So it's very, you know, for my two majors, it was really easy. Um, the information overlaps, and I've just learned a lot of skills that now when I'm doing assignments for both uh, different courses, I've kind of pulled information that I've learned from both of those, and I'm really thankful that I decided to be a double major because even though it looks intimidating and daunting at first, if you put your heart into it and you're a really hard worker, it's honestly, the work pays off. Thank you so much, Chloe. So next we're gonna have Katie. So Katie, make sure you're unmuted. Sorry about that. Um, so I am, my two majors are public health and communication studies. Um, so I came into TCNJ as a public health major and I actually didn't um, pick up my second major in communications until last summer, which was before the summer before my senior year which is pretty late, but I knew I would still be able to graduate on time um, because I've already taken classes for uh, some public health requirements because I am on the health communication track for public health. Um, so I knew that I wanted to take more communication classes anyway because I really enjoyed the ones that I've already taken, um, especially new media and health communication, which I took with Doctor Who my sophomore year. And then, um, the alcohol education project that I've been working on also sparked my interest in communication studies um, and researching like health communication theories and applying it to the project is what really showed me how public health and communication studies go hand in hand. So I figured like, why not? I should just get a degree in comm as well. And then I can adopt, you know, a wide range of communication skills that would be useful for public health. And, um, they're, the two disciplines go really well together, um, because, you know, in public health, you know, you want to try to change people's behavior and that's really centered around communicating intervention messages to people through different channels of communication. And 
Also, it's really important because as you know, as you've noticed lately, being able to communicate effectively during a health crisis is super important and essential for public health. So um, I just thought that, you know, I would be able to use a lot for public health. And I think that it will really help me, you know, be a successful public health professional in the future. So I'm glad that I did decide a double major. And it's definitely opened up more learning opportunities for me. And I have definitely improved like my writing, public speaking and research skills from the comm classes I've taken. And I think that if you have the room in your schedule to double major, then you definitely should do it because, you know, it'll give you a more well-rounded education and then you can apply skills from one major to the other and vice versa. And, um, you know, I was nervous to pick up the second major so late on in my, in my college career, but the faculty in the department um, has been super helpful. So yeah, it, it's just been a really positive experience for me and I'm definitely glad that I decided to do it. Thank you, Katie. Next, we're gonna have Deanna. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Deanna and I'm also a public health and communications double major. Um, but when I started at TCNJ as a freshman, I was just a public health major and I never really thought about ever doing double major at TCNJ and I definitely never thought about doing it with communication. But as I started taking more classes, I realized how much the two subjects really can work together and benefit from one another. I first started um, with my first comm class, which was Doctor Who's um, New Media and Health Communication class, and I took it in my sophomore year. And I realized I really liked the class and the materials, and I started taking more comm classes. And then Doctor Who also asked me to be involved in her research project, Fresh Start, which I already talked about. Um, which is just so intertwined with both public health and communications. So I realized I really liked um, the combination of the two and I wanted to add um, communications as my double major. And um, Dr. Who, my advisor, obviously really helps me get involved in the comm department. Um, and she's helped me attend a lot of different events like the different conferences and even um, different comm events like meeting alumni from the department in New York City this past year. Um, and these events and my research has also helped me realize how for my career goals, I want to combine public health and communication um, to research different health needs and health education. So overall, um, I would give some advice that um, even if you don't really know that much about um, a course or um, a field of study like communications was for me. Um, you should definitely try to explore your different classes that are available to you in college, um, even though they might not be in your academic plan. Um, you might find that you really like it and that's what happened with me where I wanted to add it as a double major. So um, yeah, thanks everyone. Thank you, Deanna. So now we're going to start transitioning to speaking more on internships. So I'll actually be going first and I'm going to talk about my major minors and then how I apply that to my internship. So if you give me one second. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. Okay, so um, I'm Christine. I'm a senior communication studies major. And then I have two minors. So I have a minor in public health as well as philosophy. So what I found that I think is really awesome is that all three of them really overlap. So um, communication studies deals with human communication and behavior patterns, um, social interactions, and then public health is the science of protecting the safety and improving the health of individuals and in turn in communities and that can often be done through education. And then philosophy is a way of thinking about the world, the universe, and it questions human interactions in life. So what you can see is that all three of these definitions, though they're different concentrations and different fields, are using a lot of the same words over and over again. So communication, 
human way of thinking. So those are all things that I applied to my internship. So um, uh, for my internship, oh, ignore the slide, but I'm the social media intern for the Streetlight. And what I found was that I was able to combine public health. So um, the Streetlight only focuses on one issue. All of our topics are about homelessness. So um, that's a public health issue, homelessness. And then a newspaper is a form of communication studies. We learn about newspapers and how to properly convey messages. And then um, for philosophy, the way you want to target issues is often falls under that umbrella of philosophy. So it's been really crucial to me to combine all three of the aspects I'm interested in into one avenue. And then in my professional career, I'd like to be a health communication specialist. So that's a way that I can combine all three of those. So um, that being said, we're gonna move on to more internships. And next we have Beth. Hi, uh, yeah, thank you, Christine. I'm going to just share my screen. Hopefully everybody can see that. So just to start before this, I am a senior communications major and I have a triple minor in marketing management and psychology. So uh, this past summer, so I'm a senior now, so last summer when I was going into my senior year, I interned at IBM as a digital sales intern. So this internship was actually very prestigious. There was about 4,000 applicants and they chose 200. So they had four like onboarding streams and there was like 50 people in each group and they had a bunch of different locations. So I lived in Massachusetts for the summer, but they also had New York, Atlanta, Washington, DC, Dallas, and a few other locations. So this was a 12 week paid internship. And basically my roles during this internship were my everyday role was to like analyze and manage leads to help generate revenue. So if that was upsell, selling more products for more money or cross-selling between the category. And then there was also other projects that we worked on. So we did some pilot projects. And then the main projects for the actual internships where we had to do a sales pitch in front of our, boss, our bosses and then other people that were via webcam. We did a practice sales call. And then we also had to do a final presentation at the end. And then during that time there, we also had a lot of prospecting workshops. And we did like an impromptu prompt to public speaking workshop every week. So we would go and speak about random topics with all the other interns. And then they also had opportunities to earn badges that you can also link to your LinkedIn account, which was pretty cool. So here are just some pictures of my time there. This picture over here is when I first started, we all went out to Dallas for some uh, four day training. And these were all the people that I onboarded with. And then because I was in Massachusetts, we got to go see some pretty cool things. So this over here was their command center that they do for crisis communication. So we got like a first hand look of like if a crisis is happening, how they negotiate and they'll go through all that in that session there. And then we also got to tour the Watson Center. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that in the news right now, but Watson is their virtual analytics. And then we also did some fun things as a co-op or as an intern group. So we went and there was an ice cream place down the road and we just did some fun things. And the good thing about the internship was it ended up in a full-time opportunity. So I went into my senior year knowing that I had a job and I would be graduating. So yeah, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. And last but not least, we will have Cassie speaking. Okay. I'm really sorry I don't have any visuals. A lot of the places I've interned at, um, you can't take photography because it's where like, all the talent for TV shows are. I'm, uh, I'm a radio, television, film uh, major, and I also minor in English. And this past summer, I got to work for um, Discovery Inc. So they have a lot of different television networks like um, TLC. And I mainly worked for um, a lot of Food Network producers and also for the show 90 Day Fiance. Um, I was a studio intern, so my main job was um, basically checking in and out all the different types of equipment for producers to use. And I learned a lot, a lot about all the different terminology for all like the sort of professional equipment and how to build like different camera kits and things like that. And Discovery was really good about um, sort of letting me learn about different areas. Like I got to learn about like the post-production department we had. 
I also got to do things sometimes like set design, which is very cool. So like when you ever see like a PSA on TV and there's like backgrounds, I got to set up some of those. And I also got to learn because of 90 Day Fiance, I got to learn a lot about reality TV, how much is scripted. And I got to do something called a stand-in, which is pretty common in um, the TV world where it's like they get people to pretend like they're the reality TV people. So they test out different storylines and you get to just be that person for a little bit. It was, it was a really great opportunity. Um, a lot of TV jobs and internships come about when you, have, when you know someone you can go to. This was kind of special because I didn't actually know anyone in the company, but I still ended up getting the internship. And my manager also left after like a week when I was there. So I ended up getting a lot of responsibilities. So now I actually continue to work there uh, in a freelancer position where I do a lot of the same work with managing the equipment they have. And it might turn into a full-time job or I'll be staying there sort of indefinitely for now, part-time as a freelancer. Thank you, Cassie. So now we want to open the floor up to any questions. So please keep in mind all the panels we had today. So you can ask a question about anything that you've seen or anything you haven't seen, and we'll be glad to answer. And you can utilize the chat function or you can ask your question aloud. The first question we have in the chat is, um, how does study abroad work for film majors? So um, does anyone want to take that question or I could answer it? Cassie. I'll just speak a little bit to it because I was actually planning on doing that for a little bit, and I had talked with a professor who um, recently retired, who he used to work in Irish TV for a while. A lot of what he told me was that it, there's a lot of good schools in both Canada, which isn't super exciting for international programs, but there's a lot of um, also very affordable schools, film schools in Canada you can go to. Also, the UK has a lot of um, different universities that are very good, and they're also in English, of course. There aren't a whole lot of film programs worldwide in English. It's not the easiest place. And also Hungary, which has, they traditionally have had like the best film schools in the world. There's like kind of a dictator there. So you don't really want to go there right now. So um, if you're starting to look into that, I would definitely recommend looking at schools in the UK to begin with. If I can just piggyback onto that, I would just say, you know, from my perspective, students have gone on to great in um, uh, study abroad experiences in both um, England, uh, the UK, um, as, as Cassie mentioned. Also, for a while, a lot of students traveled to Australia um, that were interested in both filmmaking um, as well as media studies. Um, so, I mean, I think that that study abroad experience, um, you, you can translate it into more production classes or, um, you know, more, um, I know that students have studied even in Scotland and had um, a great experiences both doing film studies as well as production. Thank you. Okay, so our next question is, how early can students start internships? How do you find internships? Are all the internships paid? So um, I'll talk about that for a little and then other people can chime in. I know I had my first internship my freshman year. It's definitely something that you want to stay on top of. Uh, LinkedIn is a great resource to look for internships. Also, all the professors in the comm department will often speak about different internship opportunities. And we have a really, really great, um, well, we're the communication department. So communication within the department where emails are often sent out saying, oh, these positions are available if you're interested. So those are all different ways to find them. You can start an internship as soon as you would like. Um, the internship I have, the Streetlight newspaper, is one that's on campus. So you can find things on campus or off campus. Um, in terms of getting paid, it really depends on the internship. Um, there's a lot that are unpaid, but you can find some that are paid. It's really the experience that you're looking for so that you can translate that into a job in the future. And if anyone else wants to chime in, go Yeah, right. I'll just add on to that. A lot of internships, as she said, are either paid or unpaid, but you can also get college credit for them. So that's another thing to think of. If you're not getting paid, you could be getting college credit for doing the internship. And I will also say that a lot of internship opportunities are talked about in a lot of clubs. So definitely try to join clubs and become active in them because they will bring companies to come speak about opportunities that they have in their organizations. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. And I just want to add that, um, yes, you can take in internships, uh, you know, as early as, uh, you know, you want to. But if you want to enroll into an actual internship course, 399, which is what Beth just said, you know, you can take it for credit, um, then we uh, limit, uh, usually we limit it to up division program, uh, up, up division students. So like, you know, at least sophomore and up, and a lot of times students actually start uh, in, in junior, if you want to take that, like the course for credits, right? But you can take as many internships as, as you see fit, right? And, and uh, uh, Beth was right, uh, and, and Christine as well, you know, about the paid or unpaid. So it really depends on the companies. Uh, but no matter what, you can ask for uh, credit uh, if you have not done so uh, in the department. Next question. Thank you, Dr. Hu. So up next we have, when you double major, are there still electives available to explore other classes? Do we as students explore internship options that we may want to explore outside of the New York metro area? So let's break them into two. So first, when you double major, are there still electives available to explore other classes? Chloe? Mm -hmm. So because I'm like journalism and communications, I've taken class like, and I'm radio, TV, and film, I've taken classes that were like public mass and interpersonal. So I kept a lot of my electives within the major, but I branched out to other tracks. So I've learned a lot about not only like the, my track of communications, but also everyone else's. And then uh, with journalism, like I've taken, you know, some like, IMM sort of classes, but you can definitely take electives. I mean, when you enroll, like when I first started, like I took a psychology class, I took my um, language requirement. So there are opportunities to take other classes. You're not going to be like constricted to just your major. Like you do have the ability to, you know, your liberal learning, so you have the ability to reach out and see other majors and kind of see all the different like classes that TCNJ has to offer. So I definitely think there's opportunity to take classes that aren't just within like the major you're doubling in. Like I had opportunities to take other classes. You just have to fit it in your schedule to make it like best accommodate to you. I would, I would just also add that it depends on um, what you come in with as a freshman, because a lot of times people will uh, test out of the first or second um, uh, language requirement uh, so that then they have those credits available to them to be able to explore other things in free electives, even with um, uh, the double uh, major. Um, sometimes, you know, as Chloe was pointing out, sometimes there are even ways that you can double count a, a certain number of classes between the two majors um, so yeah. that it will count in both majors. Uh, Dr. Who do you three, three classes. So again, so that there are more classes available to you if you do want to pursue you know, something else, um, or even another minor. You know, peop students are very creative at how much they're able to pack into their undergraduate, um, you know, uh, classes that they take between double majors, double minors. Um, you'd be surprised at how many things people are able to get out of the 32 classes. We have one more question there. Okay, so next we have, do we as students explore internship options um, outside of the New York metro area? Does anyone want to speak on that? I can talk a little bit about that. Lila. So I don't know if um, you, Joshua, want to do RTF, but if you want to do a job in TV or film, most of the jobs are in New York, at least around here. So it's a great experience. I interned in New York right now, or I did before, you know, this whole thing happened. Um, it's really great because you really get a hands-on experience of what it's like to be in the city. Outside of that, I got my first internship last summer, and that was in Princeton at um, the Princeton radio station. Um, and that was unpaid, so it was a very like entry-level thing. I worked a part-time job at the same time. But doing that internship allowed me to get the one in New York, and that's paid. So that covers you know travel and getting there and commuting. Um, but outside of New York, I know a lot of people, a few people, who intern in Texas or they have opportunities to go to California. Um, if you want to do film, I'd say there's, you know, there's like growing experiences. You can go in North Jersey, in Atlanta, like really anywhere that you, that you're interested in, there's probably something out there for you. I don't know if anyone else has like a specific experience with that, but that's what I've, what I've gathered from other people. Yeah. 
Chloe, did you want to say something? Yeah, I was going to say something on that. So I like don't live near New York at all. I live down South Jersey by like the beach. So for me to get to New York was really like would be really hard and I have to work. So I like had an internship with the New Jersey State Police and that was right in Trenton. I literally drove 20 minutes every like day to go there. And I also was still able to like work and go to school. So there's definitely opportunities like within the area. Like if you can't travel or maybe you're like not comfortable with it or you, like it like, comes down to like a money problem. Like there's definitely opportunities within the area to intern in whatever field you decide to, you know, go in or whatever track you decide to take. Like, so, like, I wouldn't be able to ever get to New York because it would take me two hours, but, like, Trenton was right around the block from, like, when I lived there, so that was nice. There's always opportunities that aren't just, like, it just depends on what, like, as Delilah says, depends on if, like, what you're studying. I, I'd also just like to add that I know of um, one of our students who interned in uh, Washington, D.C. For, for National Geographic. I believe she was working in social media um, there. Um, and other students have done internships when they've studied abroad, which is, um, you know, like in England. Uh, so that's clearly outside of the New York uh, metropolitan area. Um, I think it just depends on the student and what they're hoping uh, to do. Um, but there are ways to set up internships in, in other cities. Yeah. Do we have any more questions? It doesn't have to be related necessarily to the comm department. We're all students at TCNK if you want to ask any other questions. Okay. Well, if there are no further questions, oh, how's the food? <laughs> um, I feel like it kind of depends. What do you guys all think? Okay, so in terms of dining options at TCNJ, there's Ike Off Hall, which everyone calls Ike. Um, there's the Brower Student Center, which everyone calls the Stud. Then you have the Library Calf, Lib Calf, and the Education Calf, Ed Calf. So I think everyone has their like own favorites. I personally like the food of the Ed Calf or the Stud. I don't know if anyone else wants to chime in. <laughs> I liked Ike. I don't care what anyone says. I, I thought it was easy to go there. But Ike has lots of options. Yeah, and also Campus Town. So Campus Town has like Panera, there's um, a Mexican restaurant, like a small Italian restaurant, Chinese food. So there's lots of options. Okay, so the next question we have is, when is the deadline for housing and dorming? How are the dorms and how can you get a roommate? Ooh, some students have to answer this question then. <laughs> it's, maybe okay. we can speak from their own experience. Um, I mean, I don't know when the deadline is. I don't know if anybody else does. Um, but yeah, as a freshman, I was in the towers and, um, I really liked my experience there. I thought it was really fun. Um, there's like a lot of people in one building. So I made like a lot of friends on my floor. Uh, I didn't know my roommate. It was random, but you, I think you can, um, choose to room with somebody uh, but I didn't. I kind of wanted to meet somebody new, and we ended up getting along really well, which isn't always the case, but if you do have a bad roommate experience, you can always, like, switch rooms. Um, but yeah, my experience is really good. I, I always say that I wish I could go back as a freshman and, like, live in the towers again. Um, so yeah, it was just really fun. Yeah, I also lived in the towers my freshman year. And it was a lot of fun. There's a lot of people on your floor. I felt like everybody always had their door open. You could go and walk into people's rooms and say hi to them. Uh, I actually met my roommate through the Facebook group chat, through the Facebook group that they have for the incoming class. They make like a big Facebook group where you can meet people. And then to answer the question about specific honors housing, yes, there is a specific honors housing. Anybody yeah, so um, for the honors department, you'll be placed in uh, Norsworthy Hall, which is really nice. Um, it's like overlooking a lake, and it's just a way to bond with people in the honors community. So 
um, you would still like be assigned a random roommate unless you elect to be assigned one, but it would be another person in the honors program. It's just another way to kind of foster connections. I think TCNJ does a really great job of making sure that um, your freshman roommate and your floor is a whole bonding experience. And I I'll just say really quickly that um, I'm in the honors program, but I chose going in freshman year not to live in the honors housing just because I wanted to have like the experience in the towers as everyone said. I'm sure honors housing is great and people, I know people who have bonded really well with their floor, but no matter where you choose to live, I think you're going to have, you're going to meet people that, like I met Cassie on the first night and now we live together. Like I met some really great people. Either way, no matter where you choose to live, I think you can have a really great experience if you choose to. Yeah.